Chapter 3, Research All the Things This section is going to be very historical fiction-oriented. However, most novels set in the real world, including contemporaries, romances, and literary, require some research to properly ground your readers in setting. Even if you're setting your book in your own hometown, like a memoir, you will need to research some details to improve verisimilitude. If you're creating a science fiction or fantasy realm, then you need to do even more research. You'll want to create magic systems that work, or a socio-economic world in space exploration. Do you need to know more about black holes? Faster than light drives? How about the power structure of a medieval setting with seven types of sentient creatures vying for primacy? Do they each have their own cultures, languages, and martial traditions? Don't forget maps. For examples of extreme planners, see Frank Herbert, Patrick Rothfuss, or J.R.R. Tolkien. So, that's a huge amount of planning. Where does one start? That really depends on your personal passion. If you love politics, you might start crafting the political structure of your world. If you love travel or geography, you might begin with a physical setting. If you love history, you might first find a real historical event to base your story around. I love history. I needed to find a time of great conflict to set my story in. For Misfortune of Vision, since it's set in the 12th century, I dove into a rabbit hole of the annals of Irish history, Lady Gregory, Yeats, and the ever-mocked Wikipedia. Yes, you can use Wikipedia, but please be cautious of using that as a source. While Wikipedia can be a great tool to give a researcher a path to more reliable sources, I prefer to use those resources when I can access them. I don't rely on Wikipedia's accuracy. People can change the information at any time, without any sources. At the bottom of the page, there are often links or lists to the source data. Many are scholarly resources, peer-reviewed or published. Often, I can find a great article listed there but hosted on sites such as academia.edu or jstor.com to help me get the historical details I need. Unfortunately, I must add a caveat that some of these reliable resources are behind a paywall. However, sometimes if you can find the article you need, you can contact the author and they will send you a copy. As an example, I researched kings and social structure. I spent way too much time finding a better word for king, since that was not a word used for Celtic people in the 12th century. I looked up documents about the time period, including the Annals of Ireland. I asked some scholars I know on the period about their suggestions. After sifting through many bad options from other cultures, I finally found one which fit with Irish culture of the time, chief or chieftain. Then I researched clergy and local saints, which melded into fairy queens and holy wells. I found maps of sacred sites in Ireland, as well as the history of the larger ones. I delved into Neolithic mounds and burnt villages in the area, since I wanted my character to encounter the Fae in a mystical spot. Neolithic mounds and stone circles were the best places for such encounters. Burnt villages were a great backdrop for tragedy and violence. After a good 15 hours worth of research, no, I'm not exaggerating, I checked out the local Vikings to see if it was logical to include them as an added conflicting element and what they were called. In the records of the time, people called them Ostmen or simply foreigners. I discovered a local chief who was a renowned craven coward. When the Norman invasion reached the northern counties, he simply fled. Fantastic! Cowardly chiefs are great. Let's use him. He was the chief in Downpatrick, but John de Courcy, a famous Norman, took the town. Now I know where my main character lives, and exactly when the story would take place. She has a purpose and plenty of crap to get in the way of that purpose. External conflict is easier to meld into the character's internal conflict, adding tension and action. When I decided on 12th century Ireland, I had no idea exactly how violent this time was in the northeast of Ireland. 
I knew atrocities happened in the southeast with the Norman invasion, but this time period makes Game of Thrones look like a peaceful Sunday picnic. Perfect for high-tension stories. Sources the main historically reliable documents from the time, such as the Annals of Ulster, mostly just list the deaths of chiefs and nobles, bishops, and other very important personages. There were a lot of them. It seemed like every minor chief had a relative who hated him enough to off him for his throne. Some were details about cattle raids, sieges, or a kidnapping, but the majority were the stark mortality details. However, once you get your hands on a juicy, historically accurate conflict, some historical characters you can work into your story, and a concrete time period, you can plop your characters into the middle and see if they swim. Your tale is more interesting if your characters can't swim. I went back to do some editing on a previous manuscript to give my unconscious mind time to percolate the story. As I did so, I realize that I've already read several books set in my time period by authors whose research I respect. Ken Follett, Pillars of the Earth, Sir Walter Scott, Ivanhoe, and Ellis Peters, Brother C.A.D. Fail Mysteries, have written books set in the 12th century. While they were all set in England, a different culture and political structure, they still give me some flavor of the setting, mores of the day, and details about daily life at that level of technology and trade. For some people, anything prior to modern times is ancient and there is little differentiation between those periods. For an historian, however, or an enthusiast of historical fiction, those differences are important. And I won't even get into the debate over the misnomer Dark Ages here because I don't want this book to be 100,000 words long. For instance, a noblewoman of 17th century France would wear a completely different costume than a noblewoman in 12th century France. The Renaissance occurred at different times in different areas throughout Europe and took different forms throughout the world, just as the Bronze and Iron Ages did. Technology and fashion took time to migrate in the past, as social media hadn't quite been invented yet. When writing details of the time period, an author could research the different foods a character is eating. Pro tip, your 12th century character wouldn't order a caramel frappe from Starbucks, clothing, the way they made their living, etc. Even within professions, they might have different names, such as a wheelwright or cooper. At the same time, you need to ensure your modern reader understands the reference. Make certain that unfamiliar terms are couched in context or have a glossary in the book. Planning allows the author to create a complex web of subplots to weave around your main conflict, each one adding to the overall tension of the tale. These differences in culture can help a lot in your planning. Different time periods, cultures, even different worlds, can offer a variety of interesting conflict to assist in your plot and make your characters miserable. I then make a list of possible conflicts that arise from such an environment. There are both internal and external conflicts. Internal conflicts might be a moral dilemma, a crisis of faith, or the suspicion of a friend or family member. Someone might be dealing with PTSD, depression, or anger management. External conflicts might include that broken wagon wheel, war, or someone blocking the road. A broken wagon wheel wasn't as easily fixed as a flat tire is today. An arranged marriage was much more common for nobility in medieval times. Blasphemy was a huge worry. Conflict exercise. List out at least three possible internal and external conflicts in your story. External. Physical conflicts. Actions. Internal. Emotional conflicts. Feelings. Philosophical Conflicts, Beliefs, Values Dialogue Speech and idiom are the hardest parts to get right. It's a balancing act. Of course, the 12th century Irish character isn't speaking anything resembling English. They aren't even speaking modern Irish. They're speaking Middle or Archaic Irish, and no one today outside of a few scholars would easily be able to read it. I certainly wouldn't be able to write it. Even if it was said in England, 12th century language is very different from today's English. 
If you doubt me, go read some Anglo-Norman works. Beowulf dates a few centuries earlier and is almost incomprehensible to the untrained modern reader. Most folks today can puzzle out Chaucer's writing, which was several hundred years later. English as a language was a proto-mix of Germanic from Anglo-Saxon peasants and French from Norman nobles with a sprinkling of ecclesiastical Latin thrown in for seasoning. So, I use mostly modern English in historical novels. But I don't use pure modern English, as that would sound strange with idiom, changing word meanings, etc. Telling someone that the assassin was going to pop a cap in their victim's head just seems wrong to me. Now, some stories get by with modern usage. Shows like Spartacus or Rain have done it to good effect. However, it must be done well or it comes across as flat. Also, idiom and slang common to historical periods can be used, as long as you ensure your reader knows what they mean in modern terms. As Good Omens by Gaiman and Pratchett point out, the word nice used to mean foolish, then particular, and now, something pleasant. Words, even within one language, change meaning over time. Even if you aren't writing historical novels, each character should have their own voice. The reader should be able to pick out a character by what they say, even if you don't tell them who is talking. Most historical fiction authors sprinkle older words and phrases into modern English and try to limit the anachronisms to give a flavor of the time. Sometimes this is easy, often it isn't. It involves a lot of research, delving into resources such as etiumonline.com, an online dictionary of word and term origins, including sources and dates first found, and historical theses. Once you've written in a particular time period, you get a feel for the language. You can add a couple of words or phrases to your character's lexicon. Gift your main characters with pet phrases, exclamations, and curses that reflect the flavor of the time. If you've done this well, your reader is transported to their time and place. There is always a danger of putting in too much flavor. Have you ever had a dish that was so heavily spiced that all you tasted was the seasoning and not the food itself? Some writing ends up like that, where you have to sound out the words on the page to make any sense of what was being said. I've seen some too accurate Glasgow accents written this way. Or Cockney or in the American Deep South. Just remember, less is more. And please don't use phrases like a vast ye, knavish varlet. Incidentally, this concept also works with accents. A light dose of phrases or pronunciation changes goes a long way. Too much, and the dialogue is difficult to read. There is a historical fiction author whose books are well-loved by thousands of readers. They were set in a time period I liked, and I tried my best to enjoy them. However, the author's use of vernacular and random phrases in obscure foreign languages, such as Old French or Lowland Scots, was so prevalent, I had a difficult time reading her stories. This was in the 1990s, before the advent of easy translation software, so when a phrase popped up without context, I had no way of knowing what it meant. Enough of that, and I gave up. Swearing. Swearing is an area that is particularly difficult. A modern person swears differently than someone in the 18th century, 16th century, or the 5th century would. In the past, most swearing was religious in nature, zounds, used liberally by Shakespeare, was short for God's wounds. Now, in a society less dominated by religion, we use words more related to physical body functions. Some cultures, such as the Scottish and Irish I tend to write in, have a lovely tradition of cursing in creative ways. One such Irish curse is may the devil make a ladder of your backbone and pluck apples in the garden of hell. This is delightfully evocative. Pet phrase exercise, what does your character say when they stub their toe? What do they say when they are angry at someone? What do they say when they're thrilled? Anachronisms. These are little things that must be kept in mind as you're writing your manuscript. Little but important. A glaring anachronism can push a reader right out of the story, and their suspense of disbelief shattered. 
often small discrepancies can be forgiven, like rose matter being used to dye cloth in the 12th century when it didn't become popular until the 13th in Pillars of the Earth. These are details only a historian or pedant will care about. Others, not so much, like horned helmets on Vikings, as it's getting more well known that they never wore those. Don't make your 12th century character a Baptist, as Protestantism started in the 16th century. Location, location, location. Where do you place your story? They say to write what you know. If that were entirely true, there would be no such thing as speculative fiction, science fiction, or fantasy. However, to some extent it does hold true. Writing about a place you are intimately familiar with can help with details. Incidentally, if you are writing in speculative fiction, science fiction, or fantasy, your planning opportunities increase incredibly. You can plan entire worlds, cultures, histories, languages. Just ask Tolkien. He created a language and then decided to write novels using it as a cultural detail. I mostly write about Ireland. Do I live there? No. But my ancestors did. Well, some of them. 11% of them, according to my DNA test. However, I have visited many times, and Ireland holds a piece of my soul. I love putting details in my writing from the places I've been, and it helps to add realism to the story. For example, I've stayed in a town called Ardara in County Donegal. I was able to picture exactly how the town was set up, with the main streets forming a Y through the center. I use this setting for both Legacy of Hunger and Legacy of Truth. Since most of my books are set in historical time periods, I do research to see what was actually there at the time. The Grand Cathedral in the center of the market town may have been built in 1848, and my book is set in 1846, so maybe I have a construction site, but no finished building. The hotel was in business, and the pub, so I used them in my story. I researched the local standing stones to find one or two to feature as part of the tale, too. These details are important to me. They might not matter to most of my readers, but I do get anxiety thinking about the few who might care. How do you find such details? Sometimes it's difficult to research the history of places. Buildings such as churches can be easier, as most churches are proud of their building's age. You may have to dig a little, but usually the Catholic Church keeps good track of such things. If you write early enough, no buildings are on record. For instance, I'm working on a novel called The Enchanted Swans, which starts in 500 BCE. No Christian churches existed in Ireland then. Of course, there were lots of buildings, roundhouses, and crannogs. But few were made of stone, mostly wooden palisades. A physical or virtual visit to Craganoan or Navan Fort can help with the visualization of such structures. Landscape doesn't change much over time. Sure, bits of cliff may fall into the ocean, or mountain tops are leveled for a tourist view, but for the most part, Connors Pass in Dingle offers a similar view to what it's had for a thousand years. And having been to that view three times before I could see anything due to heavy mists, I can describe the sublime landscape view in a novel. In my novel's Legacy of Hunger and Legacy of Truth, the story is set partially in Donegal, Ackle Island, and Kenmare. I've been to each of these places, and therefore have a better handle on the geography, distance between places, and the challenges of living in such an environment. No matter where your imagination takes you, make sure to know the place before you try to transport others there. Even if it's only research via old photographs, paintings, or Google Earth, there is a way to make sure the details come through and become part of your story. When I determine the location for my story, I start with Google Maps Street View and look around the place. I look at both modern and historical photos, if I can find them. If I'm writing about a particular building, I try to find when it was built. Setting Exercise What does your setting have that's unique? Is it a seaside town? A mountain chalet? 
a spaceship heading into the sun?